G'day guys, today we're going to talk about Anglo-Saxon Paganism and Heathenism. That's coming up. There's a few things that I need to point out before we get into this video. Number one, um, I'm going to use the terms paganism and heathenism interchangeably. I know there's lots of differences there. Uh, please understand I'm trying to make this for a general audience. I'm not an expert on paganism or heathenism at all. Uh, so the next thing I need to say is I was born and raised a Christian. Um, so I'm looking at this from a Christian point of view. However, uh, I try and view history from very much a, um, a, a neutral perspective and I try to tell history the way it occurred. Okay, there's also, the third point is there's not a whole lot of source material uh, from this particular period. We're going to go into that in a second, but I do need to say that a lot of the source material that exists uh, is heavily Christianized. So there's, there's some kind of, um, there's going to be a few factors here which, which play into that. Alrighty, let's go. The evidence that we're using for this video are the writings of Bede, the writings of Oldham, place name evidence, and, uh, and archaeological evidence. The next thing is really important to understand is that on the 27th of February, AD 380, Constantine declared Christianity the state religion of Rome. What that means for Anglo-Saxon Christianity is that many of the Anglo-Saxons were already Christian. Many Anglo-Saxons were uh, under the Roman Empire. Many Anglo-Saxons um, had migrated into Britain through the end of the uh, Roman Empire. We also know that um, many Anglo-Saxons were mercenaries for Rome and would have been Christianized through that process as well. When Bede came to England, there was already in existence a Christian church. However, it wasn't Christian from the point of view of Bede. That is to say that Christianity, uh, you know, we, we do know, for instance, there's many different branches, flavours of Christianity around today, just as there was then. And some of these were not necessarily recognised uh, because of um, their slight variances with the Christianity of another branch of religion. The first thing that I want to look at in regards to Anglo-Saxon paganism is I want to look at um, some of their belief systems around the gods and the similarities and the differences with what we know about the Norse paganism because there are some subtle differences there. Alrighty, let's take a little bit of a look. Possibly the most significant of their gods was Woden. And many of the Anglo-Saxon kings and senior leaders all claimed to be descended from Woden. So we have that with the House of Kent, the House of Wessex, the House of Mercia, and the House of East Anglia. Woden was viewed as a wandering god, very, very similar uh, to Odin. I think something that needs to be said at this point is that spelling was really only standardised in the Victorian period. And I think that given that, the Scandinavians and the Anglo-Saxons all kind of originated from uh, Germanic tribes, there's going to be a lot of similarities with, the, uh, with their gods and their, their belief systems. There's also going to be a lot of similarities through the trading network. Uh, paganism and heathenism were a very dominant religion at this time. Um, for the areas that were outside of kind of Roman control. Now we've talked about the crumbling of Rome. Rome's now pulled out of Britain and the Anglo-Saxons have migrated into Britain or at least some of them have. Okay, let's, um, let's take a look at the next god. The next god is Thunor. Sounds a lot like Thor. He was considered the god of the sky and he had a hammer. There's another god, which was obviously quite a significant god, but we lack a lot of written evidence for. 
I don't really want to speculate too much because um, there's a lot of kind of beliefs around some of this stuff but in terms of actually trying to track it to primary source or even secondary source um, there's not a whole lot of evidence to grab hold of. Anyway this next god is called Freak and seems to have a similar kind of role to Frey but uh, as I say that's kind of starting to speculate a little bit too much for me. Then there's Twi and that's the to do with the star of Polaris. So I really do apologize for my pronunciation. Um, I'm not the best around some of this stuff. There's another one called Nikor, but there's very little evidence around what that meant. We also know uh, the Anglo-Saxons believed a lot in dwarfs, in giants, uh, a variety of different demons. We know that they did believed in dragons and we know that they believed in um, goblins and trolls. Okay, let's break this down a little bit more. Um, especially with dragons. Dragons had a huge symbology for the, the people of Britannia. Um, they obviously in a whole range of different flags, a whole range of different symbols and embolisms that were very, very prominent, not just to the Anglo-Saxons, but also into, into Wales. Unfortunately, uh, so many cultures have come along and suppressed the Welsh. Um, I actually have a significant amount of Welsh ancestry. Um, but unfortunately, we, we've lost so much of that history. Elves are a very fascinating one, and they're very prominent within the Anglo-Saxon culture. Uh, elves were representing um, people who could kill you at night. They were representing, uh, you know, people who could take your shadow away. Uh, they were generally viewed as a very malevolent kind of being and they were viewed as um, something to be very aware of and defend yourself against that kind of thing. So I find that quite fascinating because you can see how the elves have traveled through history and been a significant part of the, the Tolkien mythology and not just Tolkien but there are other writers as well who've incorporated elves. Orcs, uh, orca is, a, is another big Anglo-Saxon word uh, and it essentially means enemy. Uh, Orca was a, a, a reference to the Viking Raiders. It was also used as a reference to Normans. Um, and I, I think it kind of um, had the same kind of connotations that uh, more recent armies have applied to their enemies in, in terms of things like um, the way that Germans were referred to as Nazis and uh, a lot of that kind of thing. It sort of dehumanized them a little bit, but it also made people very afraid of um, the potential for what may happen. Uh, and then that's a very real thing because if you, you only need to look a little bit at the history and see how much um, harrying, which is a more recent word, the Saxons wouldn't have used that word, but harrying uh, which was done um, especially by the Normans uh, when it came to uh, um, some of the Saxon uprisings um, and the harrying that was done by the Vikings. The Saxons themselves did, did various forms of harrying at different stages, uh, especially in the earlier period. Uh, and obviously the Romans were famous for it. Uh, but there we go. All right, we'll talk about harrying um, in another video in a couple of weeks' time. The next um, thing I want to look at is sacrifice. There's a big difference here with the Anglo-Saxons and the Norse. The Norse used human sacrifice, we know this. Um, and there's this clear evidence for the human sacrifice which was undertaken by the Norse. Anglo-Saxons didn't. Uh, they seem to draw the line at that. Um, Anglo-Saxons, at least at that we, we know of, we certainly haven't found any evidence which would conclusively connect Anglo-Saxons with human sacrifice uh, and therefore we can't really ever say it's, it's, it's ever occurred. It may have done and maybe evidence will be found in the future um, and that would be very interesting. Um, but I, I, I don't see it um, because there was already a significant Christianization which had occurred um, essentially pre-migration 
as far as the Anglo-Saxons. A lot of other things were sacrificed as well, um, whether it was wildlife, whether it was um, even things like plants and so on, uh, which were incorporated into the sacrificing of funeral rites. Okay, the Saxons most commonly burnt people. Um, I find that really quite interesting. The cremations were a big thing. Um, now there was a little bit of other... As the Christianization process continued, some people were put into coffins. Some of those coffins were stone. Some of them seemed to have been wood. Uh, and some of those people were interned in, inside churches, especially sort of people of significance. Um, but by and large, people were, were cremated. And I think um, it shows the understanding of primitive people, dare I say that word, um, but, but people that far back in history who still had an idea or still grasped the concept that um, a decaying body or something like that would be associated with uh, disease and were able to draw those kind of connections. We know, for instance, that um, we know, for instance, Anglo-Saxons used soap. We know that their hygiene practices were on par with the so-called Vikings. So, um, cremations are, are perfectly understandable. Okay, the next uh, thing to talk about here is cosmology. Cosmology is quite fascinating. Um, the Anglo-Saxons believed in the seven worlds and seven realms. We actually don't really know much more than that. Um, we know that the human world, this world, is, is one of those realms. Um, it's possible, but we have no evidence for it, that purgatory was another world or another realm. Therefore, heaven and hell could be additional realms. That would be four. But we don't know what the other three may have been. And we know this because um, of the... Oh, I'm apologising for my um, pronunciation again. But we do know that uh, the Anglo-Saxons believed people lived in the world of Midgarden, which is akin to the Norse Midgard. I, I really apologise for my pronunciation. Um, I, I used to have a housemate who was um, Scandinavian, but I really haven't ever had the opportunity to learn how to pronounce many Scandinavian words. We know that the Anglo-Saxon pagans did worship inside temples. We also know that they would worship into nature, so on beaches, in caves, and on top of hills and mountains, uh, and, and have that kind of spiritual connection which that afforded them. So now what I want to do is just read off a piece of paper, if that's okay, uh, around about the on the subject of the Celtic conversion to Christianity in accordance with what Augustine wrote on in the year 697 AD. Pope Gregory has instructed Abbot Helotus that I have come to the conclusion that the temples of the uh, idols in England, please note the word England, should not in any way be destroyed. Augustine must smash the idols, but not the temples. But the temples themselves should be sprinkled with holy water and an altar set up in them in which relics are to be enclosed. To date, we have found no evidence of a military struggle or conversion by the sword against the so-called pagans. We believe that the conversion was mostly, if not entirely, peaceful. Right, so we're just going to quickly go across um, some of the festivals. Um, the Anglo-Saxon pagans had a 12 or 13 month year. And that was just to try and keep the lunar and the solar calendars in alignment. They had four major festival periods, one being in February, the second being in April, the third being in September, which was viewed as a holy month, and in November, which was a blood month, and that was about the sacrifice. The last year, I just want to talk about witchcraft and magic. Okay, so the Anglo-Saxon pagans very much did believe in witchcraft and magic. And interestingly, there actually is a whole lot of evidence uh, archaeological and through a variety of other primary sources um, and you can see this through excavations conducted by the University of Leeds and the University of Manchester whereby um, Celts and 
Anglo-Saxon pagans seem to have been able to coexist with uh, Anglo-Saxon Christians, at least in the early parts. Um, now, there does come a point, though, where through the kind of Viking incursions, Alfred the Great, in the year 890, outlaws witchcraft and magic. I, I, I believe that has a lot of connection with the, uh, the Viking raids, um, given that many of the Norse were pagans, but not all of the Norse. And in fact, um, the great heathen army wasn't exclusively Scandinavian. Uh, we do know that there were other tribes that had come across and joined. We also know that there were a variety number of, of Saxons who had, I suppose, once their lands had been conquered, in order to try and regain some wealth, had, had joined in the Great Heathen Army. Alrighty guys, um, so that's pretty much a summary of Anglo-Saxon Paganism. Please leave a comment below, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on Anglo-Saxon Paganism. Uh, I'm really interested to know, I learn a lot from you guys, and you've also, there's quite a few of you guys who've pointed me in the direction of some really good source material. Uh, and so I do like to learn. I'm all about learning. So uh, please leave a comment below. I'm, I'm looking forward to some, some discussion about this topic. Alrighty guys, I really hope you've enjoyed the video today. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.